Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's get started. Um, we're going to talk about, um, you know, a topic that is very, very hot at this meeting, right? The cerebral embolic protection. Um, we have uh, three talks and then we'll have some discussion. So let's go ahead and get started with the first talk. Suzanne uh, Barron is actually going to talk about the clinical data on uh, CEP prior to protected TAVR. So, Suzanne? Great. Uh, thanks very much. I, I'm kind of going to joke that I'm the, I'm the lead-in uh, for uh, Samir here, uh, but I will uh, get us up to date to where we are now. All right, here are my disclosures. So we know the TAVR is what we use to treat uh, AS uh, for all patients who have symptomatic severe AS. And although we know TAVR is less invasive, easier recovery than surgery, um, there still is the potential for major complications. And we know that stroke is that very important, very unpredictable complication um, that's associated with the TAVR procedure. And it, it ranges in a rate of about 2 to 4% at this, at this time in the current era. And we know that registry studies have shown that stroke patients who experience stroke do worse. Um, they have a six-fold increase in mortality. They're more likely to be discharged to a skilled nursing facility as opposed to home. They've increased rates of 30-day readmission, and they have higher index hospitalization costs. So one of the ways that we can try to deal with periprocedural stroke um, is using uh, cerebral embolic protection devices. And so shown here are some of the cerebral embolic protection devices that are either currently available or under investigation. Um, since most of them are under investigation, I'm going to focus uh, on the two that are FDA or CE mark approved, which is the Sentinel and the TriGuard 3. So just a quick slide on TriGuard 3. It's a self-positioning nitinol deflection filter. It's delivered through an eight French femoral sheath. Um, it, the initial studies of the prototype device were promising, and so the REFLECT-2 trial was performed. This was initially designed to be um, a study that was going to randomize 345 intermediate, TAVR, uh, intermediate risk TAVR patients to receive either TriGuard or not. The trial was terminated early after enrolling only 220 patients. Um, you can see that the pay, they did meet their primary safety endpoint, but they did not meet their primary efficacy endpoint, which was a hierarchical uh, composite of uh, all-cause uh, mortality or stroke at 30 days, NIH stroke scores between days two and five, and then uh, changes in cerebral ischemic lesions and volume of ischemic lesions on MRI at two to five days. And additionally, there was no difference in some of their other powered secondary endpoints either, the most important of which would be stroke at seven days. And so it was on the basis of this data that uh, when we discussed this at the FDA advisory panel, the FDA uh, actually voted against a 510K approval for this device. Now, the Sentinel device uh, is the only FDA-approved device, as well as the other CE mark-approved device at this time for cerebral embolic protection during TAVR. So it's composed of two independent polyurethane uh, filters that are deployed in the right brachiocephalic trunk and the left common carotid artery. It's delivered through a right radial uh, sheath uh, that's six French. Uh, it protects 90% of the blood circulation, including bilateral carotids, as well as the right vertebral, and it's got a minimal profile in the aortic arch, so there's very little interaction with the tower delivery systems. So this trial was initially, uh, the Sentinel device was initially evaluated in the Mistral-C and the Clean-Tavi trials. You can see in both of these small trials, uh, the use of the Sentinel device was associated with a lower volume of ischemic lesions, as well as lower rates of new lesions. And in the Mistral-C trial, uh, you can see the patients actually had a lower rate of neurocognitive decline on testing uh, when compared to baseline, uh, from baseline at MRI in patients who were using, uh, treated with the Sentinel. And so these proof-of-concept trials paved the way for the Sentinel IDE trial. This was uh, 363 TAVR patients. They were deemed high risk. They had a mean STS score of 6%. And they were randomized. Uh, there was a safety arm, and then there were two imaging cohorts. And these patients were randomized to the, either the device or the control arm at 19 centers. You had a primacy, primary efficacy endpoint that was reduction in new lesion volume in protected brain territories on MRI at two to seven days. And then a primary safety endpoint, which was all-cause death, all-stroke, in AKI stage three, uh, that was uh, planned uh, to be performed as a non-inferiority comparison against a historical performance goal. And I think this is one of the you know, important themes to bring up, which is, is that in terms of the safety endpoint, device was shown to be safe. It was non-inferior to the historical performance goal of 18.3%. And when you compared it with the control arm, there was no significant difference in MACE rates um, between the two arms. When we looked at, did this actually capture debris, the answer was yes. So 99% of patients who were treated with this filter captured some form of debris, the most common of which was acute thrombus and arterial wall, 
And then about 50% of patients also had evidence of valve tissue and calcified debris in there. And this did translate to a change on MRI findings. There was a 42% reduction in new lesion volume that was seen with sentinel use, although this was not statistically significant. And there were a few reasons that were thought, you know, that this might be the case. You know, one is the fact that the trial may have been underpowered um, in that the new lesion volume that was observed was a lot less than what had been observed in the clean TAVI trial. And there's always a variation in post-procedural MRI results in that you can see rapidly change, uh, rapid changes in new lesion volume on MRI in between two and seven days, and that was the window that was allowed for uh, MRIs in these patients. When we look at clinical stroke, you can see Sentinel device was associated with a non-significant decrease in stroke at 30 days. Trial was empowered for this endpoint. However, if you think about it, cerebral embolic protection is really only going to protect against period procedural stroke, and so there's a lot of reasons that you could be having stroke after the procedural period in between those discharge to 30 days. And so when the analysis was actually limited to looking at stroke within 72 hours, there was a statistically significant decrease in clinical stroke that was seen with the use of the Sentinel device. And so it was based on these results, in addition to the safety profile, that the FDA voted to approve the use of the Sentinel device in 2017 to capture and remove embolic debris while performing TAVR to reduce the risk of ischemic injury to the brain. So um, this trial really paved the way for a whole bunch of other studies. So we, uh, we have the, um, the Sentinel LIR study, which was a study that was looking at lower risk patients. There was a thought that perhaps only high risk patients are gonna be more likely to have stroke and you wouldn't see really similar findings. Well, this study was a single arm trial with 50 patients, STS score that was less than 4%. They were treated with the Sentinel device during their TAVR. Similarly to the IDE study, 100% of cases captured debris, and it was the same sort of uh, histology makeup of those patients. So lower risk, high risk patients were still capturing the same types of debris. And interestingly with this, there was no uh, interaction that was found between valve type or the presence of pre or post dilation uh, with regards to altering particle numbers or uh, sizes of the particles that were captured. Um, they're shown here are the results of four single center studies that adopted the use of this technology. And you can see that every single one of them demonstrated a significant decrease in the risk of stroke with the use of the Sentinel device. Now, we didn't see quite the same findings uh, with regards to registry studies. Again, this was a little bit more mixed. Some registry studies did show a significant decrease, some did not. But generally, the findings were a little bit less robust. And there's, you know, a lot of reasons to think about why this might be. Um, you know, first of all, we know that sites routinely report lower rates of stroke in registries. And that's often because there's less, <clears throat> less neurological evaluation uh, in these studies. If you're going to have a neurologist that's going to be picking up and evaluating all these patients, they're more likely to pick up subtle strokes. It's going to increase your event rates, and you're going to be more likely to detect an uh, event rate difference. Secondly, there's probably some selection bias in patients who are being treated with cerebral embolic protection in these registries. In general, uptake has been pretty low. It was 4% in the Germany uh, registry that I showed the last slide and about 19% of sites uh, of cases in the TVT registry in 2019. So it follows the patients who might have received cerebral embolic protection were the patients who are going to be at the, who are considered to be at the highest risk for having a stroke. And that really ties into the issues of unadjusted confounders. We know that there are a whole, a whole slew of patient level uh, considerations that can increase or decrease your risk for having a stroke during TAVR. And many of these uh, variables are not collected or available in uh, registry analyses. And so that kind of leads us as to what further data is, is, do we still need uh, to support the routine use of cerebral embolic protection in the TAVR population? Well. We have the protected TAVR trial, and uh, Samir is going to be talking about that uh, in about two minutes, um, so I won't even get into that. But we also have the BHF Protect TAVI trial that's going on. It's going to randomize just under 8,000 patients, uh, looking similarly at the use of CEP versus not, and the rates of stroke or, uh, at 72 hours. And then this is a, you know, a, a it cause it's near and dear to my heart, but I think we also need, we, this has been talked about, we need to think about what the economic rationale is for routine cerebral embolic protection use. Because the reality is this device does cost money, but we know that strokes are incredibly costly, both in the short term as well as in the long term for the healthcare system, and certainly from society as a whole when you start to think about caregiver um, and quality of life. And so the reality is, is we do need to be able to put a quantitative number that shows the value of these types of devices for this patient population. So in summary, stroke remains a significant complication after TAVR. The use of cerebral embolic protection devices offer a method of reducing periprocedural stroke associated with TAVI. 
The Sentinel device has been shown to effectively capture procedure-related device uh, debris during the TAVR procedure while maintaining a very good safety profile. And the protected TAVR trial has, and the BHF Protect Travity trial will pro uh, provide us with more data regarding the efficacy of the Sentinel device in reducing clinically apparent strokes after TAVI in an all-comers uh, population. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne, uh, for a beautiful summary. So my co-moderator, Tom uh, Wagner from, Ar from um, Arizona, is going to lead the discussion. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barron. That was a, a wonderful summary of contemporary data regarding CEP and TAVR. Uh, it, it always is a curiosity to me. If you think about doing a, a PCI in a vein graft, it's a class, class one indication. And yet we're still struggling with this concept of protecting the brain during a procedure that we know leads to stroke up to 3% or 4% in some studies. So that is always something that I've been grappling with. And, and I'm excited to uh, sit here with uh, Raj, uh, who led the tr uh, charge with our protected TAVR study. Uh, and would love to see uh, more growth in this space with the understanding that we need some very clear data to make a change. But being pragmatic, it is the brain. Again, it's a class one indication to do a vein graft PCI with a filter, but yet we're still struggling with this concept of protecting the brain during a procedure that we know leads to stroke. What are your thoughts, Raj? I mean, of course, uh, we were all early on blown away by the fact that every time you captured material, right? Samir showed that uh, leading the uh, Sentinel trial. Yes, uh, there was no significant reduction in strokes, but the post hoc, the post -hoc analysis as Suzanne actually showed at 72 hours looked promising. So we, uh, we made the decision that there is evidence, enough evidence to use it till there is evidence that we should not use it. And, you know, so I think our reaction is emotional in addition to, because stroke is such a bad thing, right? So I think uh, that was the reason why we actually did use it. But I think now we have a large data set and I think that's what Samir is going to talk about no, I agree. Uh, similar to the vein graft, carotid stenting. So carotid stenting, uh, I started with the carotid stenting in the past when uh, NGOGAR was designed. We could not do a randomized trial. So there was, there is no randomized trial for carotid stenting. And uh, still, you know, the first trial we did was with RioPro versus Percusurge. So we did a trial like this where we use uh, RioPro and uh, the other group at Percus Surge. You know, this is before the filter devices. So this is all possible uh, to do, but you know, it makes sense, so people use it. Anyway, I'll present the next one. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, I'm Raj, no. <laughs> I'll present the uh, data because Raj was supposed to, but he gave it to me. Uh, these are my disclosures. And you saw this, uh, the very important part to understand is that these, we are putting a Sentinel device, of course, during the procedure. And uh, the question is that how long the stroke happens after the procedure. So is it just at the time of procedure or 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, one day, two days, three days later after the procedure? So this is a good question. At least in the partner study, we found that most of the strokes happen early on. And so this is why the peak is so tight. So this is a time variant analysis uh, by with Dr. Gene Blackstone we did to say, and again, this is the recognition of the stroke. So the emboli can happen earlier and the stroke is recognized many times later because when people wake up from anesthesia, that's why the TA tower had a peak that was a little bit more blunted and a little bit more delayed. Survival is, as you see, four times less or four times more, and the confidence, you know, if you took the hazard ratio, it is almost six. So there is a six times higher mortality, and there is two thirds of the patients cannot be discharged home after stroke. You saw this, so I'm gonna skip this. So the protected tower study was designed, and we debated this many times, to say that we are going to just do clinical strokes, that was the idea. Uh, with the use of CEP, with all commercially available devices, and in all patients. So whether we wanted to enrich the population by taking just the high-risk patients or 
medium risk or low risk, but we decided to do all patients. And this was by design. And it was a uh, randomized trial with 51 centers in North America, Europe, and Australia. This is important to recognize that uh, it was uh, a neurological examination at baseline and 72 hours, 3,000 patients, one-to-one -one randomization. And the neurological exam included a uh, modified ranking score, NIH stroke scale, MOCA, and the CAM ICU score. So all of this had to be done at baseline and at discharge. So it is a fairly well-organized neurological trial. Neurological uh, endpoint was just simple endpoint to say all strokes at 72 hours or at discharge because many of the patients are discharged before 72 hours. So it's discharge or 72 hours. The hypothesis was that uh, as you saw that there was 2.5% stroke risk in the TBT registry, which is self-reported. Since we are going to have neurological exam, most of the studies suggest that you will see 70 to 100% more strokes if the neurologist systematically examined the patient. So that's why we presumed that it will be 4%, 4 to 5%, and we went to 4%. And the Sentinel, all the data from the single center registry showed 66% reduction in the stroke. So we thought that we will go with a 50% reduction. So that's why the assumptions came as 4% and 2%. So if somebody, you know, I didn't describe this in the original publication, original presentation, but this is the rationale for making it four and two. And the idea was that we are going to have at 70% enrollment, which is 2,100 patients, uh, a sample size adjustment. And there was an algorithm for that to say that if you are going to be able to increase it to up to 6,000 patients, we will go for it. And if it is not, then we will not. And then it will be 3,000 patients. So the DSMB looked at the data and thought that uh, we have to go to 3,000 patients. This is also predefined that we are going to define the stroke as uh, CEC adjudicated. CEC adjudicated stroke so the CEC adjudicated stroke with uh, ischemic stroke, type 1A, hemorrhagic stroke, type 1B, uh, or stroke that is not pre-specified, or covert stroke. We were not looking for covert stroke. So in case people did, for whatever reason, they think that it was not stroke or something, and they did a uh, CT scan and they found a stroke, that would be a very rare situation where we will have a covert stroke. And other... Uh, additional adjudicated events were disabling stroke, mortality, TIA, delirium, AKI, and uh, vascular complications. So it's very important to recognize that this was pre-specified to have all these things done by the CEC, including the major stroke. So 14, 1499 patients in the control group and uh, 1501 in the CEP group. Important to recognize that CEP was possible to be deployed in 94.6% or 5% patients, because as you can see, only 83 patients that we wanted to put us out of the 1,500, only 83 did not have the device placed. And this is because of the radial or brachial access issues in 42, and 31 had a brachiocephalic or subclavian tortuosity. So again, to recognize that very large number of patients, uh, it was easy to put this particular device. This is intention to treat analysis that I'm going to show. So there's 1499 and 1501 patients, typical tower population, 80 years of age. Uh, females were more in the CEP group. And this is a little bit of a uh, issue because the females are known to have higher stroke rate and they were more in the CEP group just by the chance. Uh, the STS score was 3.3 and the surgical risk low, intermediate, and high, as per the site, were equal. Uh, CHEDVAS score was 4.2. And if you look at the procedural characteristics, still about one quarter of the patients were general anesthesia. Uh, local anesthetics were 75%. Uh, and the, most of the patients had tricuspid aortic valve. Still, we allowed the bicuspid and the bioprosthetic valves in the study. Balloon expandable valve was two-thirds, 
and pre-dilation was 41%, post-dilation 25%. So this is the primary endpoint. So primary endpoint is all strokes, 2.9% versus 2.3%, and p-value is 0.3 with a difference of 0.6. The non-disabling strokes were not different, and the disabling strokes were different, 1.3 versus 0.5, p-value of 0 0.02, and the difference was 0.8. If you look at the disabling strokes and divide them into the ischemic and hemorrhagic, the ischemic strokes were 17 versus 6. So 17 patients versus 6 patients. So again, most significant difference in the ischemic strokes. Obviously, it will not change the hemorrhagic strokes. This is, a, I think, an important message also to keep in mind so that if we have the Sentinel device, did the Sentinel device work or not? Meaning that if the device was placed in the territory that we think is protected, how many strokes happened? So it turns out that the only one stroke could be such that the protected territory had a stroke, which was the last patient where the left MCA territory had a stroke. If you look at the other seven patients, the two had hemorrhagic stroke, one did not has, have a CEP placed. The fourth patient had a complicated tower where there was CPR uh, hypotension. So again, this is a different kind of a patient. And the other three patients had occipital lobe uh, infarction. And the third one, we don't know because there was no MRI, just a CT scan. So we don't know where exactly it was. But again, one patient only out of 1,500 had a stroke in the area where the uh, cerebral arteries were protected. So at least the concept-wise, it works uh, that we can prevent the stroke if we can prevent the emboli from going to the brain. Safety was excellent. There was uh, uh, safety composite outcomes, same in both sides, and only one major vascular complication with the CEP. Acute inj kidney injury was no different. This is also an important slide to say the subgroups. So the light blue is all the all the subgroups that we studied for all strokes. Again, you can see that there is not a single easily identifiable patient subgroup uh, where you had a statistically significant difference or a marked effect or no effect. Uh, they look all very similar, especially on the disabling stroke side. It is extremely similar uh, on all subgroups. The asterisk represents uh, the confidence interval that does not cross the unity. And you can see that in the United States, in all strokes, uh, did not cross the unity. Of course, it's one of the many subgroup analysis that we did. Uh, and then in the disabling strokes, there are several of them uh, that are statistically uh, not crossing the unity line. What are the limitations of the trial? So it was a practical trial in the sense that we started during pandemic, we ended during pandemic, we wanted to initially do it during the in the TVT registry. Uh, we wanted to minimize other data collection, so there is not a whole lot of data collection from the trial. Uh, we are just looking at the stroke at 72 hours and only follow the patients beyond 72 hours if they had stroke. Uh, neurological professionals were not blinded to the uh, patient's clinical co course and the hospital record. Again, this was uh, for the feasibility of the trial and making it more practical uh, that how we can make this happen. And the study was not powered to detect uh, a treatment difference in the disabling stroke. It was not a primary endpoint. It was a secondary endpoint. What can we conclude? That it was feasible in 94.4% of the patients. CEP did not reduce overall periprocedural stroke. However, fewer disabling strokes were observed with the use of CEP, as I said, uh, mostly ischemic strokes. And there were no specific subgroups or anatomical factors that were identified which strongly favored the CEP use for overall stroke reduction. Clinical implications that if you are going to consider the CEP to reduce the disabling stroke, since we didn't identify a specific patient population, you will have to use it in all patients. 
number needed to treat because it's 0.8. Of course, there is a confidence interval around it, but if it is 0.8% uh, reduction, it will be, uh, you know, 1,000 divided 0.8, so 125 patients. And since the safety of the device was established in the trial, the most important thing that would determine whether you're going to use it or not is going to be the cost-effective analysis or the cost of the device in the future. Again, I want to thank uh, the top enroller. As you can see, Dr. Makar and Dr. Wagner both are here. Uh, 365 patients and 237 patients, huge number of patients enrolled in the United States. Ab Abdul Wahib in uh, Leipzig uh, enrolled 350 patients, 347 patients. So, and these are all the sites that enroll more than 50 patients. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Axel Linke, uh, who was the co-PI uh, from Germany, and the uh, study chair is Dr. Amari Leon. So thank you all for your attention. And it was published, as you know, uh, yesterday in New England Journal. Terrific. So thank you, Samir. Samir, you want to keep the microphone? So, so Samir, um, this was an amazing study, right? Thank Three, you. 3,000 patients. Uh, but we didn't have a clear win. And I think the trial results are subject to individual interpretation, right? Some people might look at this as glass half full, others glass half empty. Um, so what would you, you know, make an argument as to why? So this is a good, you, good question. If, yeah. So why should we use it? Why should we use it? So if you say the, that's what I put it in my clinical conclusion that for all patients you should consider it. And I know that we are in the Boston Scientific booth, but this is nothing to do with uh, Boston Scientific. So this is important to recognize that. So if you look at the emboli protection in the, in, the, in the current literature. So this said that we reduce major stroke. So is it true or not is the question. So if it is true that we are reducing major stroke, I think we should use it. What is the evidence to say that we have other evidence to say that the major strokes are reduced by this? So the administrative databases do not allow us to know what is major or what is not major. So the only thing we can count is people dying or not. So if you look at the NRD, so that's why I already had looked at it, we published it. So the NRD database, National uh, Readmission Database, to say that how many people died after stroke with CEP or without CEP. So the people who had the CEP, the death rate was less, suggesting that the major stroke must be less because we are looking at just death after stroke. The second was TBT registry that Raj and Dr. Uh, Cohen wrote the paper. Again, the strokes were not reduced, but the death rate after stroke was still less in the CEP treated patients. So that also pointed to the same area. Then we looked at the Cleveland Clinic database. So we have 3,000 patients uh, where we studied people with, with or without. So same number of patients that we have in the whole trial. 1,500 with and 1,500 without with the CEP. We had 16 strokes with four deaths in the CEP, and we had eight strokes and no deaths with, without CEP. So again, the death rate was reduced, and the major strokes were reduced. We had, the, we had a neurologist be part of the paper. He reviewed all the things, and we put the NIH stroke scales and the MRS strokes. So if you consider all the data in aggregate, from Cleveland Clinic, from NRD, from TVT, and from uh, the randomized trial with the CEC adjudication, I think it makes sense to me that the major stroke is reduced. And if that is the conclusion of the trial, this is the only part that we are not 100% sure because secondary endpoint. But if this is a conclusion of the aggregate data, so-called aggregate, then I think it would be a reasonable thing to suggest that until the uh, British uh, study is completed and we combine all the data together, we should use the emboli protection uh, for the patient if it is cost uh, effective. This is the last piece, it's a little tricky, and that's why I'm saying that in the Boston booth so that they got to understand that we have to work together 
to make uh, it is cost effective. Samir has a great, great summary of the trial. A couple interesting points, Raj, that I took away from this. One is that the device is easy to use, great safety profile, um, and we can't, we, we can't predict who can get or will get a disabling stroke during a tower. So that, the subset analysis I thought would be more illuminating, uh, and that still is a little bit of a head scratcher. Uh, you know, there's a 60% relative risk reduction in disabling stroke when you have CEP. Uh, that's pretty powerful. Again, it's a secondary endpoint, but that still in itself is pretty powerful. Uh, if you talk about stroke and disabling stroke, disabling stroke is a life-changing event for a patient. The non-disabling stroke, most people can get by with limited disability. On top of that, you're adding about $130,000 per annum to that patient's healthcare costs. So there's, there's a, a negative impact to the healthcare economics when you have a disabling stroke. Raj, your thoughts? No, I think uh, there is cost of stroke, uh, and I think that's an important thing too. But I think TAVR is a very, um, I mean, it uses a lot of resources. There's always economic pressure. So I think cost issue is a very real one. Um, and, you know, for a busy program like ours, I think if you put into account <clears throat> the 0.8% reduction in disabling stroke, you're talking about five fewer strokes a year, which is, you know, which is significant. Because I can tell you when, you know, when patients have stroke, you, you talked about this being a life-changing event for patients. It's also very depressing for the operators, actually, you know, when, you're, when a patient actually has, has a stroke. So I think it is reasonable conclusion, um, Samir, that for people who are using it, I think it's a very reasonable thing to continue to use it. And I think as the data pours in, you know, from the British uh, studies, I think we'll be able to make more definitive conclusions. No, I, I, agree. I agree with you that it, it is very traumatic to see patients and doctors both because every stroke that we had, I still remember the patient and the family. So, uh, and as you said that it is seven to ten, five to seven strokes, major disabling strokes. So, this every other month you will have a trauma. So you will lose so many years of your life and patient's life uh, by those strokes. That's what, how. Excellent. Very good. Uh, let's keep moving forward. Let's invite Dr. Vino Tharani. Uh, he's going to discuss what's next for CEP. Thank you, Vino. Great. Thank you so much. First of all, um, another thing that people haven't spoken about, Samir, I want to congratulate you for really the first pragmatic trial that's happened in TAVR. Um, we're working on another one through TBT. We both try to get this through TBT. We were unable to for a variety of reasons, but we're trying to change that process through TBT. But I wanted to congratulate you because this is the first and largest pragmatic trial done in TAVR uh, in the United States. So uh, great job. Um, these are my um, disclosures. <clears throat> so uh, here are some of our agendas. We're going to start a little bit more with a secondary endpoint. And as a surgeon, um, we see a lot of strokes in general whenever we do valve surgery, but the only thing we care about, the only thing I care about is a dislabing stroke. Everything else is somewhat immaterial to me uh, because as Roger, you mentioned, or Tom, you may have mentioned, you kind of live pretty easily through that. And when I see somebody at 30 days, the regular TI strokes are irrelevant. The disabling strokes still hound you, right, Samir? You still see those patients 30 days and they still don't move their arm or their leg and their face is drooping. So for me, when I look at the big picture, that really is a big important thing. And we'll go through a couple of these things. So first of all, um, here you can see, and uh, Samir eloquently has pointed out already the, the, um, the aspect of what the, the stroke rate from 2.9 to 2.3. I walk away from this, Raj, a little bit differently. And I think of how impactful this saving stroke is going to be. And so um, statistics are one thing when you look at the overall primary endpoint, but I still look at data. Data still shows that I had a 60% reduction in disabling stroke. And for me, that's very powerful. Um, maybe that's why I'm not the editor of New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and so when you look at the mortality rates, I mean, look at this. This is staggering. A meta-analysis, 29,000 patients, if you, you have a four-fold increase in stroke. I mean, this is remarkable data, five-fold increase in another 10,000 meta-analysis patients at TAVRs. What it, it is, un, and I, I would imagine with surgery, it's even worse than that for us. So we're looking at a massive increase in mortality if you have a stroke post-TAVR. 
And here you can see another study from 136,000 patients in, in Jack Interventions in, who developed stroke during hospitalization were included. 1.85% uh, uh, of them had CEP and 1.9% and, uh, without it. Um, and you can see this is in hospital mortality. Um, and again, what, what we're seeing over and over again is stroke with TAVR, after TAVR with CEP, significantly less. In hospital death is less. The routine discharge to home is significantly less and 30 day re-emission is no different. So it just shows you the safety is great, but the mortality differences are staggering across the board with all significant uh, uh, values. The post-tower stroke, uh, post strokes and other events may not be acutely apparent. We talk about this in surgery all the time. I hear this a decent amount when I see patients at 30 days, they're like, hey doc, I'm, a, I'm still a little fuzzy. Is that gonna get better? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think that, you know, we don't, as surgeons, we're very intelligent. We, we don't see the patient after 30 days. We send it back to you guys in cardiology. But, you know, there are some patients who are never 100% right after having some type of neurologic event. So these silent cerebral infarcts, I think, are more important than we give uh, credit for them for. And, and Samir, as you mentioned, you know, or Raj, you mentioned, you see a little particulate matter whenever you look at the filter. You know, and if I had not captured that, imagine those silent cerebral infarcts that are occurring. And so, of course, the, the rate of silent infarcts, if you look at a variety of, uh, of, of areas, look at TAVI, it's 4.58, right? The number of SBIs. And so, uh, mean value, it is, it does happen quite frequently um, across the board for these patients. <coughs> Excuse me. And these minor strokes are satiated with some type of cognitive impairment, about 44%. You can see depression happens quite a bit. And physical impairments at three years following stroke also occur. So this is, even if we don't see these, it still continues to, to haunt our patients even after we've seen them in the 30-day process. And they have an overall societal effect also on younger working population. As now in the TBT database, so 30% of patients are low risk that we do Tavron, 30%. All we need to do is a tavern of a 65-year-old that has a stroke that's going to affect their next 25 years in the prime of their life. So I think we need to be very careful about in the younger working populations how it totally decreases in almost 80% of patients, their social activities, almost just north of 50%, they're unable to return to work, and another financial strains that occur after that. So the short-term clinical costs of TAVR or related stroke are very high, um, a 23% increase the average hospitalization cost. And at this time, Raj, you're right. I mean, we're under the guns of getting patients in and out. Um, we are, at least in Atlanta. And I'm sure everybody else are too, especially with some DRGs of TAVR going down. Um, it increases a hospitalization by four days and increase your mortality by up to three to four, uh, four fold. And of course, so I think we really have um, a, a lot to think about in my mind as we, as we think of these. So the increase in acute and long-term disabling costs at acutely, about 59,000. Um, I can't wait till we see the results of what, uh, what we see here in the economic component for the CP trial. Um, one year, about 130,000. Long-term, about $200,000. You guys have alluded to this already. Uh, the BHF is doing their own randomized trial. Um, 77,000 patients uh, randomized with and without. Uh, enrolled um, 2,700 patients already um, as of September of this year, so really moving along. And the primary outcome is discharge of stroke at 72 hours uh, with an interim uh, look at this. You know, I, I would have been curious also if we had powered this, Samir, to disabling stroke, what would our numbers needed to be? Not 3,000 for all stroke, but I, I am curious on what that number would be. Maybe, maybe you've done that calculation. 8,000 patients. We could have done an 8,000 patient trial. So. That's okay. Or, uh, or, or we could have done a 4,500 patient study, and if you had the same magnitude of reduction, 20%, in the all strokes, it would still be positive. Right. So there would be much less. I think, you know, that would actually also end up being a, overall a positive And that's study. part of the problem, right? Because we don't have that many events, we have to use all stroke, not what, is what we really care about is disabling stroke. But we did a study so that the end's not too high, we do it all stroke but we miss a little mark there because I think we didn't take it out to the disabling stroke, which is what all of us in this room care about. There are insufficient 
uh, evidence to recommend routine use, um, but Protect Tower does suggest that the approach might reduce the saving stroke, which is what I personally care about. And I think we'll have to take a look at this. There are some implications for the BHV Protect Tabby. Is there an urgent need for this to be complete timely recruitment to kind of look at this also uh, in, in, uh, for CEP and Tabby? And, the, uh, and this will, of course, re uh, recruit about 7,700 patients. And uh, there has been a gentleman's uh, shake about, uh, uh, about looking at these and unblinding these together as a combined data set. So we'll have 10,000 patients to look at. The, the uh, forms are very similar. So when that study does get done, uh, thanks to Boston and uh, BHF, there will be some hopefully merger of some databases together. So as we kind of conclude that the saving stroke remains the most devastating complication after cardiovascular procedures for surgeons and for, for cardiologists, it can lead to four to five fold increase in short-term mortality. Um, it provides CP provides a 60% relative risk reduction in the saving stroke through 72 hours. And this represents the largest reduction to date of anything for a TAVI. And future studies, of course, are, uh, are, are um, pursuing forward to look at this. So I want to thank you for inviting me to do this. Excellent talk. You know, excellent talk. Thank you. A quick comment. I'd love to hear from the rest of the panel, uh, Raj Samir and, and Vino and, and Dr. Barron. What did you experience uh, at, at your center uh, with consecutive patient enrollments? And did you have or perceive to have a selection bias? Meaning if you saw a patient that had a hypermobile chunk of calcium on the non-coronary cusp, on a TE or CTA, did you enroll that patient or, or did you uh, pull them out and do a commercial device? And a second a subset question is the BHF study, as you know or may not know, they do not have Sentinel or CEP as a commercial option in the UK. So that will be a very interesting point to make. Raj. Yeah, I mean, uh, we tried not to uh, create a selection bias in terms of, an, or enrollment bias rather, when we were actually enrolling patients. In fact, we enrolled a cardiologist with a heavily calcified valve in the study because we actually told him, listen, this is the data, this is the trial, and he actually participated in the study. So, uh, but there were patients who didn't want to participate in the study, all right? So I think we can't, uh, but at least there was no systematic, but that may have occurred. You know, while it didn't occur at our site, I think that I think there is one obvious limitation, and as you mentioned, uh, the technology is not that widely used in in the, in the UK, so I think from that perspective, the trial will be a little bit more pure, you know, in terms of uh, enrollment bias. Excellent, Dr. Barron. Yeah, I mean, I think I think when you think about it, it, it mirrors a little bit of what the PFO trials showed us, sort of the same idea, which is that you know patients who you thought absolutely needed their PFO closed, they were going to get an off-label use or an on-label use of getting their PFO closed, and these trials took a long time to enroll and many trials to get the answer. I think what's really impressive about the protected TAVR trial is, is that despite having commercial approval, we're still able to enroll 3,000 patients in a relatively short period of time during a pandemic, no less, um, to really get some of this information. I think with the number of sites that were involved, you know, I'm sure there was, you know, of course, there's probably a little bit of selection bias, but I, I suspect that the number of sites that were involved, particularly the big enrollers, you know, really made that effort to try to reduce that amount. Excellent, excellent. Vinod, what are, you, what are your comments on that? Uh, I think that it's going to be, um, you know, I, I have, you know, I think that once we, I think we'll get a better idea once we put the two databases together. To me, that's going to really, I mean, there will be nothing bigger than that. It'll be 10,000 patients for the most part. I'll be, I think we'll be able to make that happen. And, and as I said, I mean, um, the idea that Samir was able to get this done, I agree with Suzanne, during this um, pandemic and as a pragmatic trial, I think it sets the model for what we should do in the future. Um, I think that's going to be really important. We're trying a new pragmatic trial with RV, LV pacing. That's going to be coming through. We want to randomize 5,000 patients um, pretty quickly. So I think you've set the bar pretty high um, as far as what to do. Uh, Samir, with Samir, what are your so, closing remarks? Wrap it up. So no, the one before you had the one... Uh, one idea to just know that the uh, UK trial does not have a neurologist uh, to see the patient in uh, all patients. So this is a little bit of a challenge. So they will only have the neurologist see the patient if patient has stroke. So this is why 
it is a little bit uh, different trial. Samir, you didn't know all cardiologists are double boarded in neurology? <laughs> right. So, but again, initially I thought that the TVT registry would underestimate. TVT registry was fairly accurate in identifying the stroke. So I'm hopeful that the uh, United States cardiologists at least could identify the stroke as effectively. I'm hoping British cardiologists do the same because they got to see the patients and, uh, they, you know, because this is a, I, I don't know the system very well, but the idea is that it is a, it is one difference. Uh, the second difference is that, uh, so this is, you know, we will see, this is the mo mo major important difference. Of, of course, they have a larger number of patients, their assumptions for stroke are less and their assumption for reduction of stroke is less. So that's why their uh, sample size is larger. So, and we registered meta-analysis before we unblinded our study. So these are all positives that we were planning to do this. Dr. McCarr, Raj, why don't you wrap it up for us? What are your final closing remarks with CEP and TAVR in the contemporary TAVR practice in the U.S.? I, I think that what we have learned from this large randomized trial is that it is safe to use it. So I think that chapter is closed. Um, I think we had a modest reduction in overall stroke, which did not reach statistical significance because of the fact that it was underpowered for the actual observed uh, percentage of strokes. And uh, it, it makes sense that the filter would technically convert some larger strokes into smaller strokes and the biggest impact would be in disabling strokes. So I think it all makes sense, all right? I think, so I, I would make the argument that there isn't enough evidence to say that you should not use it. I would make the argument that I think we can continue to accumulate more evidence so that we can emphatically, hopefully, answer this question in the future. But I think there's no reason to stop using it if you're using it, and I think that the disabling stroke story, if you buy into it, is a very important one. And I would say that, you know, if you're a busy program, I think it's important to use it. Excellent, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today in the CEP talk. Uh, we'll be up here for a few minutes to answer some questions. Uh, on behalf of Boston Scientific and our esteemed panel, thank you very much.